Well, I got interested in travel narratives partly because I think Canadians uh, always have this elusive notion of identity. We're always trying to figure out what our identity is. And one way of exploring that is to explore how others see us. And travel narratives, there was a great many written in the early 19th century by British travelers. Um, came over here and um, saw Canada, of course, as a land of opportunity in many ways, uh, and uh, wrote extensively about their experiences. Um, partly you could see these as kind of emigration uh, promotional books or brochures, and partly it's about just uh, what you will discover, Niagara Falls, Quebec City, all that sort of thing. They hit all of the sort of main uh, scenic highlights. Um, but I, what I ended up sort of arguing is that um, they transport uh, kind of a British way of seeing, and I, this is not my own idea, this is, many historians have written about this in other, you know, parts of the British Empire. They describe things in a, as either picturesque or sometimes sublime, and, and, and so they see the landscape, and it's mostly the landscape I'm interested in, not the urban areas, um, as kind of a transplanted England. And one of my first studies uh, on this theme was looking at the travel narratives, if you want to call them that, or the memoirs, letters written by young men coming to the Fraser uh, Gold Rush in 1858 and the following years. And I was surprised to learn how many of these there were, and very well written because these are very well educated young men. And they're partly here as adventurers, very few of them, none of the ones I saw struck it rich. They're mostly like fish out of water. They're not prepared for the hardships that they're going to face. Um, but what fascinated me was their descriptions of the mountains and uh, the dry country and so on, you know, when they get into the Kamloops area and so on, it was very picturesque. It was not seen as uh, a rugged, hostile land. Um, and using those colorful images that you would, you know, would not think applied here at all. And I, uh, the argument that I, so-called post-colonial historians use is that this is, you know, this is a form of colonialism in itself. It's, you know, it's looking at a landscape, at a colony, let's say, uh, as if it was British. Uh, and of course, they really liked Victoria because Victoria, because of the natives' uh, fire ecology, was park-like. It wasn't densely forested. You just had large open spaces with trees here and there. And so to them, this was, you know, the ideal landscape. Uh, surprised me, though, that even, you know, uh, in areas that are very unlike that, they still saw it that way. And I, on the eastern townships as well, I mean, I, I looked at uh, land company promotional brochures in the 1820s and 30s, and they had testimonials at the end of these brochures, all tended to be written by uh, what I would call gentility, uh, you know, uh, landed gentlemen or uh, younger sons, let's say, writing letters uh, home. And again, talking about it as a kind of a pastoral paradise. The townships is rolling hills, well, lots of lakes and rivers. To them, this was ideal. They did not, they advised people not to go to Upper Canada because it's flat, it's uh, swampy, it's malarial ridden. And so it was a good gentleman's country in a way, right? It was a place where you didn't have to grow wheat and work hard, you could have cattle, you could have livestock, which meant, you know, nothing much to do in the winter and so on. So I see that kind of vision uh, various places across Canada. I haven't, uh, the prairies is, was, would be more of a challenge for that for sure, because many of them see the prairies as kind of hostile. But uh, I've often, I've also seen descriptions of the prairies, you know, the, the waving grass and the colors and so on as being quite picturesque as well. So that's the America, that's the British vision. And I think, um, I wouldn't say it's part of the Canadian identity, but it's part of the identity of Canada as a country. Um, and. Uh, and in fact, they are more interested in many ways in the landscape than they are in the people. They're interested in the natives, but they usually are very pejorative about the natives. So today, Canada's image, you know, if you see how it's promoted in, in 
by tourism pro projects uh, or um, particularly in British Columbia, it's, it's like it's an empty land. You know, Canada is seen as a big empty land and uh, the wilderness is very much romanticized and so on. Um, and, and I guess I, I'm arguing that that goes back a long way. I don't not necessarily think that we're using picturesque images anymore. We're more emphasizing the, the sublime, right? Uh, but uh, particularly in British Columbia. But, uh, you know, one would not realize that most Canadians live in cities if you, if, if you were looking at it from the perspective of an outsider. Um, so it goes back a long way. I'm also interested in looking at Americans and how they wrote about Canada, and that's very few historians have done that. There's a lot of, you know, quite a lot of work done on the British. For example, if you take Susanna Moody, Catherine Partrail, uh, Anna Brunel, J Anna Jameson, and so on. I mean, these are these their books. They're not so much travel narratives as settler narratives, but their books are a part of the canon, right, of Canadian literature. Every first year Canadian literature course, and. So we, have, we know a lot about what these early British gentry settlers thought about Canada and how they experienced Canada. Not very much about what the Americans, who were a large part of the population, thought. They didn't write as much, that's part of the reason they, they, uh, they, they weren't uh, of that sort of genteel class. But I was interested in, in American travelers and uh, and that's a project I'm just involved in right now. I haven't gotten that far in it, but having done a bit of reading, uh, it's surprising to me. Well, for Lower Canada, uh, Quebec, let's say, uh, much the same view as the British. The French Canadians are seen as backward uh, peasants, uh, friendly, but you know, uh, because they're Catholic, because they're because they're seen as having outdated farming techniques, they're colorful. So, they're part of a kind of a tourist attraction. Um, and but when you move westward, um, Americans are as interested in this wide open land as the British are. And the British, particularly after 1880, they write a lot about when the CPR comes across the country. A lot of British travelers write travel narratives because they see that, well, after all, they write them to sell. And a lot of British are interested in coming here and making, you know, and becoming uh, settlers. And uh, they depict the land as uh, fertile and ready for uh, ready ready for exploitation. I mean, in terms of uh, farming uh, and wheat growing, it's kind of romanticized, and the difficulties are on uh, downplayed. Um, what that has to do with Canadian identity, I'm not so sure, but uh, I think what I'm looking at more is the identity of Canada as a country, uh, as, a, as a country that uh, is wide open for immigration, which has you know, lots of uh, opportunities for uh, making good in a way. And the Americans describe it the same way, which is what I found a little bit surprising, because when you look at Canadians, like Principal Grant, who wrote a couple of narratives about going across Canada, uh, Principal of Queen's University, George Grant, uh, and, but many others as well, they depict uh, the Western United States, particularly south of the border, as a desert. They argue that magically at the 49th parallel, rainfall begins to uh, increase and the land is of better quality. And uh, of course, Pallister's Triangle, you know, incorporates a lot of southern Saskatchewan and Alberta, but um, by the 1880s and 90s, that becomes minimized. And uh, so uh, um, more and more settlers move into what land that was too marginal, really, to farm. <laughs>